Welcome everyone to the Women's Council on Energy and the Environment. I am Barbara Tyron, the past president of WESI, and it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to another event in our virtual executive exchange series. Today, we are very honored to have the Alliance to Save Energy president and CEO, Paula Glover, as our special guest. Paula has more than 25 years of energy experience and became the Alliance to Save Energy's seventh president in January, 2021. Prior to that, she was president and CEO of the American Association of Blacks in Energy, ABE, which is a nonprofit professional association whose focus is to ensure that African-Americans and other minorities have input into the development of energy policy, regulations, and environmental issues. Paula has also 15 years of experience in the energy industry for both electric and natural gas distribution companies. Earlier in her career, she was community awareness director for the regional YMCA of Western Connecticut. As always, this session is intended to be yours and to be highly interactive. So please send any questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and I will be happy to moderate them. I'll start uh, with a few prepared questions in advance while you formulate your thoughts. And again, welcome everyone and so delighted Paula to have you with us here today. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you so much for the invitation um, and for the introduction. I mean, good afternoon, everybody. It's really a pleasure for me to be here with you, my fellow women in energy. And if you're a man in energy, it's also a pleasure to be with you. I don't wanna assume. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Alliance to Save Energy, I just want to share we are a nonprofit, bipartisan coalition of business, government, and environmental and consumer advocacy groups um, that believe that energy efficiency um, is the first solution to our energy systems challenges. Um, I like to just say, look, we should start with energy efficiency and then we do the other stuff. Um, I started as president of the Alliance at the beginning of this year, January 1st. Um, and it is a bit of an understatement to say that it's been a busy 8.5 months. Um, we've had a new Congress, a new administration, um, some really ambitious energy transition goals here um, that's been laid out for us. Um, we're still seeing the impact of last year's racial justice movement um, and how the conversation around racial justice and social justice has been affecting our businesses, our policymakers, and our communities. Um, we've seen climate change. We're saying knocking on the front door, banging down the door, climate change is here um, and making it clear um, that it's not a problem of the future, it's today's problem. And then through all of that, we still have this whole pandemic, this whole COVID thing going on. So um, if you all thought that 2020 was going to be the most, as I like to say, is actually 2021 is turning out to be the most. Um, however, through the craziness of all this last year, um, there's been this inkling of hope, right, that things might change. Um, and we are really coming upon a lot of once in a lifetime opportunities. Our theme at the Alliance is build back brighter, um, which means that we just want to go back to work for our energy system. But we want to actually address the things that weren't working well in the past. And a huge component of that for me is ensuring that equity is an absolute pillar of our work, um, both in our internal processes and in our external work on energy efficiency policy. Um, so what I'm gonna do is take this time to spend a few minutes and dive into what my vision is for the Alliance, um, talk about what not only why is equity important in the energy space, but what are we at the Alliance doing about it? How are we thinking about it? So first, why equity? Well, listen, if the past year has shown us anything, it's that both economic and environmental crises are not experienced equally across our society. Um, on the economic side, for example, COVID-19's impacts on Black Americans um, have been close to double, um, excuse me, <clears throat> COVID-19 has left Black Americans with close to double the unemployment rate experienced by white Americans. 
Um, on the environmental side, we just saw that EPA released a report just about a week ago that confirmed that communities of color are significantly more likely to feel the impacts of climate change, which includes higher sea levels, flooding, and excessive heat, um, all of which we've seen firsthand this summer. Um, and depending on where you live, you've seen it firsthand in the last several weeks. Um, add these economic and environmental crises um, to the longstanding issues in the energy sector, which includes the fact that energy workers are overwhelmingly white and that communities of color are far more likely to face higher energy burdens than other communities, um, even after controlling for income. Um, it's clear we got some problems that we need to work through. One of the reasons that I was drawn to the Alliance, though, is because I believe that energy efficiency is a solution um, that truly is at the nexus of all of these challenges, that energy efficiency can significantly and permanently lower energy costs for households having trouble paying their energy bills, um, which, by the way, is one in three families in the United States. Additionally, um, efficiency is the largest employer in the clean energy economy. We employ more than 2 million Americans. Um, so there's an enormous opportunity for workforce development, economic mobility, um, and to get the workers that have been hardest hit by, the, um, by this past year back on their feet. And finally, um, energy efficiency is the single most impactful solution we have for reducing carbon emissions. Um, the IEA has found that energy efficiency improvements alone can get us 40% of the way to our Paris Agreement targets. And so my vision for the Alliance is therefore, it's an organization that we're gonna lead on this opportunity to build a more equitable energy system through universal adoption of energy efficiency. And I am lucky that I have a board and a team who are aligned with this vision um, it was not even, I won't even say a hard sell. It wasn't a sell at all. It was the obvious that we all came up with this together. So as I mentioned earlier, there are two sides to this vision, right? There's our internal work that we're doing at the Alliance and our external work. Um, and the internal work comes first because um, you don't have to have much of a right to sweep like the neighborhood until we've gotten our own house in the order, right? So taking care of home first. Um, so in the summer of 2020, before I was president of the Alliance, um, but while I served on its board, we did adopt a series of principles on diversity, equity, and inclusion, which included commitments to contribute to greater social justice in society, walking the walk on equity communications and assessing progress with hard data and improving our listening and transparency around all of our DEI initiatives. And we've continued to build on these commitments in the past year by diversifying our team and by having more open conversations about our own organization's culture um, and what we can do to ensure that everyone feels valued and that they have a voice. Um, so there's not like a check it off the list project, um, but this is a continuous process of listening, learning, acting, and then checking back in. And it involves all of us. And I um, am pleased to say that we're all committed to the work. Externally as an organization, what works primarily on them, um, we work primarily on federal policy. Um, so I'm always want to make sure and ensure that equity is baked into that work. Um, as I mentioned, I believe that universal adoption of energy efficiency is the first solution for a more equitable energy system. Um, but there are many barriers that we're going to have to overcome to get to universal adoption. Universal adoption is going to require a targeted policy approach to ensure um, that programs truly are reaching the underserved communities who need them most. Um, an example of this within the, uh, the Alliance's policy work is the Main Street Efficiency Act, um, a piece of legislation that we're thrilled to see introduced introduced in Congress last month by Congressman Peter Welch and Senator Catherine Cortez Masto. Um, the Main Street Efficiency Act is a piece of legislation that would provide low or no cost energy efficiency upgrades to small businesses across the country to ease their energy burdens. Um, it would allow them to invest in their workforce and decarbonize their facilities. Um, many small businesses struggle to access the credit and capital needed to make efficiency upgrades. Um, and this is particularly true for minority owned own small businesses, um, which can face all kinds of other systemic problems and discrimination. Additionally, um, the numbers show that minority-owned businesses were the hardest hit by COVID-19's impacts. No shock there. 
Um, therefore, we believe that the Main Street Efficiency Act had to be designed to reach these underserved communities. And as you introduce, um, the legislation really prioritizes funding for diverse business owners, as well as diverse contractors who work to get the upgrades done. I think it's a highly innovative approach, helping small businesses lift up other small businesses. Um, and we are working around the clock. My team is at the Alliance to ensure um, that this legislation will pass into law. But Main Street is just one example. Um, I'm striving for the Alliance to think carefully about the impacts of all the policies that we engage in. Um, it means that we have to think about who it benefits and who it doesn't benefit. Um, what we can do to direct benefits when they're needed most, and what we can do to actually follow through once a bill becomes a law to ensure it accomplishes exactly what it was set out to do. And I would argue that these are important considerations for everyone in the energy and environmental space to really think about carefully. So I'm excited to take some questions from Barbara, um, but to wrap up, I just wanna reiterate that our current moment, um, while it is full of a lot of uncertainty, really calls for big ideas and bold vision. Um, and we've moved past the time for quick, fish it, for quick fixes. Um, it's really time to look at our roots and what's wrong with our energy system, economically, environmentally, and equitably. And we need to implement solutions that are gonna build a brighter energy future for all. It's why I've been committed to this industry and this work for as long as I have. Um, and I know that this requires internal reflection at our organizations. Um, it requires a deep look at the on the ground impacts of our external work. Um, and it's certainly hard work, but that work is beyond what's needed right now. Um, I'm ready to get with it. I know you all are too. And so I appreciate your time and look forward to our discussion. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Paula. Really appreciate you taking the time to lay out that inspiring vision for the Alliance to Save Energy. And, and thank you for your leadership with that organization and in that entire community. Thank you. Um, as Paula mentioned, we're, we're eagerly awaiting questions from our audience. So please do not hesitate to put them into uh, the box at the bottom of your screen, the Q&A box, so that we can begin to have uh, a dialogue here with all of you. And thank you, everybody in the audience, for being a part of today. Um, I will go ahead and ask a question or two while you all are thinking of where what you would like to ask Paula Glover here. So Paula, um, would you say that buildings are the next target of opportunity for energy, uh, energy efficiency, or do you see multiple pathways going forward? Yeah, I would say um, buildings should be a priority, but they're not the only pathway. But buildings are absolutely, the building envelope, um, both commercial buildings as well as residential buildings is a really important nut for us to crack if we're going to try to meet our decarbonization goals. And so at the Alliance, we think about public buildings and we're supporting Open Back Better, um, which is a bill sponsored by um, Congresswoman um, Lisa Blunt Rochester and Senator Tina Smith, which would really direct about $22 billion to public buildings, federal, state, and local, so that they could adopt efficiency measures. Um, and I do think that this bill passing creates an opportunity for us not only to have broad adoption of energy efficiency in our buildings, but to also increase resiliency in our communities. Um, and again, create a space that can allow us to be a little bit creative about we, how we can engage our communities in our energy system. Um, but then we also need to think about our homes um, and our apartment buildings. Um, and that's probably even a little bit more difficult, right? Where we have to meet people where they are, people are starting in different places. But what we know is that the programs that we have in place, um, as wonderful as they are, are not enough. Um, that we have housing stock that is incredibly old, um, that we have individuals who are living in homes um, that are probably substandard, that just need insulation, windows, and doors. Um, they need the basics. Um, and then we have homes that need other kinds of technology. And as uh, energy efficiency shifts and changes and we become more digitized, um, it's increasingly going to be more important that we create space so that these new technologies, efficiency technologies can be adopted by all households. Um, but that starts with a strong foundational building envelope. Um, and so buildings is a big chunk of it. But the other piece I would say um, is transportation. 
Um, and so to the extent that we can ensure that efficiency is part of the transportation conversation, that includes um, things like cafe sta standards for our liquid fuel vehicles. But also as we're thinking about electrifying transportation, um, we need to be thinking about where are we putting charging station infrastructure? Are we creating space so that all um, individuals have access to that infrastructure? Do we have um, existing infrastructure that can adopt additional charging load? All of those things really matter um, and I think are going to play a big part, not only in our ability to address climate change, but more importantly, it is a role that we in efficiency um, can play and should play um, to do the right thing and get us where we need to be as a country. I like your characterization of energy efficiency as our first fuel and and its application to um, both buildings and to the transportation sector. Sure. Um, I'm wondering as we look out into the five to 10 year horizon here, if you see new marketplaces or new technologies that can um, perhaps interact with energy efficiency in innovative ways. Sure, sure. So um, <clears throat> we call, I think, the future of efficiency at the Alliance active efficiency. And it really is the way that we describe the digitization of our electricity grid and, and how um, our appliances and other tools talk to each other. So behind the meter, we know um, that our dishwasher and all these appliances can talk to one another. Um, Alexa can turn on my dishwasher or my washing machine um, and all that other stuff. But on the other side of the meter, um, our appliances can also, right, our HVAC systems and our companies, um, if you're participating in a, in a load demand um, response program or a, a load shedding program, um, that really requires that you have appliances that can talk to the grid and the grid can talk to that and the company and you're okay with the company being able to control it and all this other stuff. But foundational to that um, is broadband. Um, and so we at the Alliance, while we are thinking about new technologies and the future of energy efficiency and how um, technology can really add to resilience um, and demand response, um, as I share with you, equity is, is foundational to what we're thinking about. And that means that we have to think about broadband and the importance of broadband and what is it that we can do as an alliance to ensure that people are thinking about broadband as again, a foundational investment and infrastructure tool that we're gonna need for the future. Um, one of the things that I think we all came away with from this last year, particularly the last, the last year, is that energy is now a right. Um, we think about energy and the way that we engage with energy in this energy system very differently because we've all, many of us have been home, um, locked down with our families and our friends um, for 365 plus days. Um, but we're also seeing that students are relying on it, right? Because they're going to school at home and now you need the internet. Um, because without the internet and what we're seeing on the back end is, right, those students who have not have access to broadband um, and those school systems that have struggled with um, technology because they don't have the right infrastructure um, are left behind. And so what we're saying and thinking about the lines is as we are promoting active efficiency, we believe in these new technologies, we believe in the efficiency gains and the decarbonization gains that we can get from these technologies. And at the same time, um, if we want to do this work equitably and impact all households, then we have to think about that foundational infrastructure, which is broadband in this case. That makes a lot of sense. And I certainly agree with you that after the 18 months we've all experienced here, why if the value proposition of electricity and, and the technology that it fuels isn't evident to every single person uh, in the United States and around the planet, why um, I don't know what it would take to it make take? everyone aware. And so you're absolutely yeah. right. And again, to all of our listeners, please, this is, this is an interactive session. Please do feel free to type your questions into the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, my next question is about the um, discussions that go on today around fuel diversity. Uh, and often it seems that energy efficiency is omitted as a source of energy or fuel. Um, and I'm sure you, as we've talked about, consider it to be, of course, not only an energy source, but potentially the primary energy source in a broad portfolio. Mm -hmm. And I've heard you say in past speeches, Paula, which I so much liked, that this is not about targeting fuels for elimination. This is about being embracing 
around the optimization of all of our resources. Can you talk a little bit more about those concepts, please? Yeah, sure. So, you know, as I think about it, as you mentioned, um, Barbara, is that we at the Alliance as an organization, we're fuel net neutral, um, but this isn't about what fuel you use. And quite frankly, even if we are um, having an energy system that is 100% renewables, you still need efficiency. Um, we've got other things that are going on in our energy economy, which is that I think are equally important, and that is energy burden and energy insecurity. Um, and so I mentioned that particularly as we're talking about renewables, energy burden being the percentage of someone's household income that is spent on energy. Um, and what we know is that black and brown households have a higher energy burden than their white household counterparts. Um, energy insecurity um, is making a choice between paying that utility bill versus buying food or medicine. And we know that one in five American, one in three, exactly 30% of American households are making that choice at least one month a year. Um, if you think about Hispanic um, households, then it's 40% of Hispanic households and 50% of African-American households. So it doesn't even matter what you burn. The value of efficiency is that I want you to have the same exact quality of life that you are currently enjoying, if not an improved quality of life, but I want you to be able to use less fuel doing it. And that's really what I think makes efficiency um, really special and important. And so as I think about the broad scale of challenges that we have as an industry, um, it's not just climate. That's one. It's not just workforce and diversity. That's two. But it's also how are we going to transition to a just energy system? It's also how are we going to reduce the energy burden on households? And it's how are we going to um, reduce energy insecurity for so many people in this country? And I just fully believe that energy efficiency, because we're talking about doing more while using less, we start there. That's my opinion. That's a great place to start and to go from going forward. Um, so I know you were very involved with the Alliance before becoming the president in January, 2021. And you've mentioned earlier in your remarks that, <laughs> and I, I'm sure it's true that it's been a very busy year and, and certainly an unpredictable one. Nobody could have possibly known what this year would hold for us. Mm. But can you, can you talk about any particular surprises that you've encountered since becoming president in January? Um, nothing, I don't know that I'm particularly surprised. I think what I've probably been most surprised by, and I think my, my collective team might agree with this, is that doing everything during a pandemic, um, layers on challenges and none of us really would have considered. So I started a new job in a pandemic. I've had members of my team who started new jobs in the pandemic. I have members of my team who I've never met um, and they have never met me. Um, and so we are all at home. And when I say, and, and I, I say this in with all purpose and meaning, I believe that my team is exceptional at what they do. Every last member of my team is exceptional. But people are dealing with whatever they're dealing with at home. If that's childcare, if that's getting their kid to school, if that's aging parents, it's all of this, plus they're working, plus now we have the Delta variant. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that I try to be thoughtful about, and I don't know that I'm 100% there, but I, I try really hard, is like ensuring that we are giving one another grace and that we take a minute to just reflect that none of this is normal, um, that we are increasingly more stressed um, and a lot more strained. Um, and I think I was surprised um, by how easy it is to forget that this is not a normal situation that we're in, um, that we've gotten used to it because we've been in it for now over a year, 18 months, but that doesn't make it any more normal. Um, and so as a team, we're all learning how do we give one another grace and be far more empathetic um, because there are lots of other things that people are contending with during a work day. Very beautifully stated, thank you. And again, I'm going to encourage our audience to please feel free to ask any questions. Uh, we have Paula Glover here with us, the president and CEO of the Alliance to Save Energy and all your questions are welcome. So please enter them uh, using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, so moving ahead here, are there any obstacles that you see to energy efficiency today? It, it is a very unusual time, as you said, and 
definitely not normal. Yeah. Um, but are there some particular barriers to energy efficiency that you would like to overcome in your presidency? Yeah. I mean, I think one of the barriers that we are going to have to overcome as an organization, and many of us um, in Washington um, will have to do that, which is that issue areas which were naturally bipartisan um, and not an, or nonpartisan have become partisan. Um, and so it's the messaging is important, like what you're saying um, and who you're talking to and how are you making a case or an argument for what you believe is important so that it resonates with the person that you're speaking to. How do you make it important to them? Um, can be a particular challenge because you know, you're used to just, it's energy efficiency. Everybody loves us. This is not a big deal. Um, and yet it is a big deal. And that doesn't mean that everybody doesn't love us, but it, what it does mean is that they have so many other competing interests and priorities um, that we are challenged by ensuring that our messaging rises to the top um, and making a case for why what, we, what we're advocating for and what we, that it's important and it, and it should take a priority. Um, so that's one big challenge. Um, and then the other really huge challenge I think for us as efficiency is how, um, as we think about our colleagues in the broader energy sector and particularly even the clean energy sector, how do we ensure that they are also thinking about efficiency as an important tool in their toolbox and that we are not something that people just kind of skip over um, because we're talking about using nothing. I'm not talking about oil, burning oil or gas. I'm not turning, talking about hydro. I'm talking about using nothing. And so how do you um, create some excitement around that as we're talking about this transitional energy period? Good, thank you. So in addition to everyone um, struggling with the pandemic as, as human beings, why we're also seeing some of the institutions and organizations in our society changing as well. Uh, and we've certainly seen um, uh, politics and divisiveness creep in, in and between um, institutions uh, within the energy sector. We've seen the arrival of new organizations and, and in some places, the merger of organizations. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you work with similar organizations to the Alliance to Save Energy and how you think coming out of COVID, whenever that is, how, how that, those relationships might change or evolve? So, you know, that's a great question, Barbara. I, I came into this role always thinking about collaboration and partnership, no matter, you know, I, I don't think of other organizations as competitors even if they're in the same space and have some of the same kind of work that they're doing. Um, we at the Alliance are a coalition and I think we're a really strong coalition, um, but that does not mean that there's not room for partnership and collaboration. I think that there is. Um, but I would also say that you know my entire approach um, to problem solving is what might be described as systems thinking, which means that I'm always looking at all the other interconnection points of a problem, not just the problem. Um, and so a, a simple example would be, as we think about um, diversity, DEI, as it relates to workforce, um, we'll talk a lot about like, how do you identify diverse candidates? Where should I be recruiting people from? Um, how do we get into particular school systems? You know, like this messaging around how do you get students um, thinking about a career in energy? Um, I would stretch that to say, okay, but in certain communities, we do have to think about um, the public education system um, or students who can read um, and, and because all that stuff is connected. Um, and so not every problem is ours to solve um, but I do think it's important to be aware of the problem so that you can foresee the challenges that may exist or because then you're able to identify some other unique partnerships who um, partners who may also be interested in what you're doing and may not know that there's a direct correlation. Um, and yet through that partnership, they will see, they could see some value um, and you can see some value. So I just think partnering is really important. And particularly as, as you mentioned, as we're seeing that, um, large organizations um, are being created, like you know the Clean Power Association, um, which was AWIA and some others. Um, but all of us, I mean, I'm very pleased. I think all of us who run these organizations are 
more than just friendly with one another. And we all, I think, have a perspective of, okay, how can I work with you, um, ACPA? How can I work with you, SIA? How can I work with you, ACOR? How can I work with you, API or EEI or AGA? Um, are there places where we intersect? Um, are there opportunities for us to do some good stuff together? Um, and I would expect that to continue um, you know, when COVID and this pandemic is over, if for no other reason, because I think whether your organization is large or small, what the divisiveness that we're seeing in society writ large, I think is compelling us as individual leaders to really lean in on partnership and collaboration. Um, but not to increase that divisiveness, but instead figure out the counter to that is, okay, how do I partner and collaborate, particularly with those that I may disagree with? Um, because good work can happen there. Good, that's wonderful to hear, thank you. Um, we do have a diverse set of participants with us from all over the country. You do not have to be a WEC member to ask a question. Anyone who registered for today's forum is invited to provide a question using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and all questions are welcome. So I'll continue until we start to see them appear um, mm -hmm. in the Q&A section. Um, so given the visibility around DEI initiatives and the clean energy transformation, which are really coming together and at a very rapid rate here, uh, your background seems absolutely perfect, Paula, for the leadership role that you have today. Uh, can you talk about how you're using your past professional experience in this new leadership position? Sure. So um, I'm going to be completely frank. Please. Um, I will tell you that for me, what kept me in this industry as long as it has kept me really was this equity component. Um, you know, I think as a young professional, when I started to learn what energy insecurity was, that wasn't the term that was used, but when I understood that as a Black American, um, my community did engage with our energy system differently than other communities, that kept me super duper interested and then really helped me um, to continue to think about what are those intersect, those connection points, right? Um, and so over the course of time, I think you get less fear, you get more fearless about like speaking truth to power, calling a thing a thing, um, being comfortable with saying like, hey, you know, um, as a woman, this is how I experience this corporate environment because this is what people say to me, not thinking, maybe thinking, maybe being insensitive, whatever that is. Um, and so I think, you know, all of that work in collision with my, this my passion and interest in the topic um, has made it so that, um, I feel comfortable talking about it. I think the gift that the last year and 18 months has given us, and I will, um, it, it is absolutely a gift born out of tragedy, um, is that we as organizations are now more comfortable about hearing the message. Um, I think I would say, and it's been a slow kind of slow turn, right? Five years ago when I, you know, were people interested in talking about TEI? Absolutely. But the conversation was so different. The conversation was about how do I get more Black kids to be interested in STEM, for example. Today, the conversation is far more holistic. Um, we are starting to think about um, justice and energy. Like, whoever thought we would think about that? Um, and so I think the, the, the activities of the last year have been part of that driver. I would also say, though, right, um, the focus on ESG, um, you know, environment, social, and governments that our organizations are contending with um, and working through also has risen, um, has increased the interest in this particular topic. Um, because that S, which is social, while it is not clearly defined, um, is at least trying to get to this idea around diversity. Standard & Poor's, um, I recently read, like their definition of S and ESG is really how does a company interact with policymakers, with its community, and with its own workforce and employees, right? Social is like super big and very comprehensive. Um, and so in that space, you're finding more organizations who are really looking at their numbers um, and trying to figure out what kind of commitments they can and want to make. And that has that's somewhat to do with hires, but that's also how do we spend our money? 
What are the companies and the businesses that we spend our money with? Are we looking at diverse suppliers? And this is all things that people have always known. There've been tons of studies and reports of um, how much more money you can make by having a diverse board, by having a by working with diverse suppliers. Um, I just, I feel like the last 18 months, it's all kind of bubbled up to the top and everyone is saying, wow, we just, if we don't deal with it now, we're never going to deal with it. Hmm. Um, and I feel lucky that I get to be in the middle of all of this stuff. Like it's, 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 you know, it's fun. It's a lot, but it's fun. I enjoy it. That's great. That's great. Well, we're glad you're involved in all of it as well. We've talked a lot about what's happening here in the United States, um, but I know the Alliance has members from other parts of the world and you've had events and forums in, in other parts of the world over the years. Can you talk about any, any activities in the international arena or any vision that you have? Um, is it the same for what you described in the United States or do you see a different role for the Alliance overseas? So I will tell you, like, transparently, I, I don't know that I have a vision for our international activities. And we have pulled back, partially because of COVID. Um, we have pulled back a little bit on international activities. And my um, colleague, Lisa Jacobson, who runs the, least, the Business Council for Sustainable in, in Energy, she's actually come up. So this question is probably better, better for Lisa than it would be for me. Um, you know, I think for us at the Alliance, we're clearly paying attention to what international trends are, and that helps inform how we think about things here um, in the States. But we have stepped back a little bit from our international activity. Um, and so I don't, I don't, I wish I did have a vision for it, but I'd be, anything I tell you would be me making it up on the spot. I really, I don't, I apologize. No, that's okay. I was just curious. Um, yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's good to know that um, Business Council for Sustainable Energy is involved in this arena too. So uh, yeah. as, as you said, this is a collaborative effort. Everybody can't Absolutely. be everywhere. So it's nice right. to know that resources are being optimized across the sure. entire sector. Um, one last call. We do. We are um, over 30 minutes into our session here with Paula Glover, the president and CEO of the Alliance to Save Energy. So if anybody has any thoughts they'd like to ask her, or anything you'd like to share as a comment or uh, regarding her remarks or the work of the Alliance or, or anything relative to the topics we have discussed together, please do feel free to enter it into the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. So I know we have, um, usually in, we see events like this, Paula, we have early to mid-career um, women some, and men sometimes uh, who are seeking professional advice. Uh, so. Can I ask you, as a very successful example of leadership within the energy sector, is there any advice that you'd like to offer um, those who are early to mid-career regarding how to enter the energy uh, field, uh, how to become successful in it, or any overall tips that you'd like to share? So I'm going to give you two, two things. Um, one is stolen. Um, I, sh I share with Barbara and I'll share for the audience. Um, Bronco Terzik, who's one of the people that we see it gave an award to many years ago, um, former FERC commissioner, um, was actually a CEO of the very first company that I worked for, Yankee Gas, and became a mentor and a friend. Um, and one of the first pieces of advice he gave me um, as a young woman was, read everything, read everything, read as much as you possibly can, um, business journals, newspapers, People Magazine if you want, but being a ferocious reader and consuming information um, it just helps you have such a broad understanding of like a whole lot of different topics, um, but also allows you to connect some problems and issues together and, and really help, I think helps you to be thoughtful. And I always, I think that was just the best advice I've ever gotten. And, and I do it all the time. Um, akin to that is, listen, I would say, um, hold on to your level of curiosity. Be curious, be curious about things ask questions, um, you know, doing all that. But for young women, and well, for young people in generally, you know, and I, and I have four children and, and I say this to them as, and they're in the workforce. It's like, every fight is not worth having, ha is not worth having. Um, every slight is not always directed towards you. 
Um, and we always have to remember that our workplaces are a microcosm of our society at large, the good and the bad, the things we agree upon and the things that we disagree upon. Um, but at the end of the day, there's something that you can learn from everybody. And so if you think about that in terms of how you engage with people and having an endless curiosity, um, you'll be surprised at how much you get from that um, just by asking questions and, and just trying and, and understanding that every single person that you will run into, no matter what their job is, has something to contribute. Everybody does. Right. And it is for us, um, if we are leaders, aspiring leaders, or don't even want to be leaders, it is, it is our job and our duty to recognize that and treat people with that level of dignity and respect. Lovely. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing those thoughts. Um, as we see the advances around electrification across the society, um, do you see any paradoxes with energy efficiency and electrification? Do you think that uh, because electricity can't be seen, as it were, that um, perhaps that'll impact uh, concepts around energy efficiency or consumer awareness of energy efficiency? Um, so I'm not sure that it will affect consumer awareness. I actually think electrification probably makes people a little bit more aware about electricity and creates an opportunity for them to be more aware about efficiency. Um, I would suggest though, that even as we're moving towards electrification, if that's what as a society we're gonna do, we have got to keep affordability at top of mind. Um, we just have to, I mean, it, it, energy is not affordable for a lot of people now. And electrification, what I, I don't want to see us do is use electrification as a tool to solve one problem while at the same time creating another. And so the beauty about technology um, is that sometimes it lets you leapfrog stuff. Um, and we don't know what the right, right, what the right, right response is going to be, or ultimately um, in 2030, 2040, 2050, what our energy system will look like. Um, but what I'm hoping is that as we're thinking about it, today, um, we're not writing off new technologies because we've just decided that we don't want them. Carbon capture could be something that's incredible. Green hydrogen is could be another really big opportunity. And so um, talking about electrification and having electrification as a focus is important. Making electrification the only focus, I think, is not going to serve us well. So there's a lot of talk today about the ongoing energy transformation. And as you know, Paula, and, and many in our audience do as well, this has been building up momentum over, over many, many years. This is certainly not something that's brand new. Um, would you say at this point, as we see the technology changing and the convergence of electricity, gas, water, broadband, telecom, all coming together um, uh, and sharing similar concerns and opportunities, that this energy transformation is inevitable at this point? Yeah, something's gonna happen. I, I don't know what it's, what, what it's gonna look like. I am not sure. I think if we are all at the table, I mean, I'm glad that you mentioned water because that's the other one that always gets like left out. Um, but it is, it's hard work because it does require that every voice be heard. That's what makes it hard. Um, and that's actually what probably makes it a lot more complicated and, and maybe even take longer than we'd like. But I, I just believe that the only way you're going to get to the right solution is by doing it the hard and the long way. And, and so we, those of us who lead these organizations, um, we need to ensure that we are staying close to each other and communicating with one another, and then asking who's not here. Um, so for us at the Alliance, one of the new partnerships that we're starting to form is with the Utilities Telecom Council. And I mm -hmm. shared earlier why I think broadband is so important, but broadband is one of the things that they've been focused on for a really long time. Um, and so it doesn't make sense for me to embark on my own thing on broadband when I can call Cheryl, who runs UTC, and learn from her what she's doing and then figure out how can we work together? How can I support what you're doing? And she's asking, how can I support what you're doing? Um, and so it's, it's just important, I think, that all of us in these organizations, especially in Washington and our policy advocacy organizations, we, we know each other. 
um, you know, we, we're making the rounds. We all know each other, but we need to be really invested in working together and having these tough discussions so that we get to the right outcomes. Great, that's nice to hear. Yeah. So as, uh, as the president of an organization with, um, as you said, many exceptional staff, all exceptional, but, but a big staff, um, have you learned anything um, during this public health crisis, um, either in, just from your own readings and discussions or, or from these other uh, colleagues at other associations that you think translate into best practices going forward in 2022 and beyond? I mean, I think with my team, what I've learned, um, right, is how much we can do not being in the office. Um, I find with that I probably spend more time than I expect with members of my team telling them to shut down oh, more than anything else. Like there are members that I'm just like, you know, and, and I have this phrase, I'll say, you guys, you know, we're not mining uranium. Like we really don't have to work 90 hour weeks. We can take a break. And I, and I think that's going to be, in my role, increasingly more important to ensure that we do that. Um, I think, you know, the other thing is that as leaders, we're all kind of learning from one another and trying to figure out, like, what is the best practice in terms of people going back into the office? Do people need to go back into the office? And if they do, like, how are we going to manage that? Um, and, then, and, and be sensitive to every individual's own level of comfort about being around other people. So we'll... Um, we have a high vaccination rate at the Alliance, so we don't meet frequently in person, but we feel comfortable meeting in person because I think it's like 100% or 99%, like just about everybody's vaccinated. Um, but in the beginning, we still wore masks, even though we didn't have to. We did um, because we understood that not everybody is coming at it from the same place and we wanted everyone to feel comfortable. Um, and so as leaders, I think those are the things that we can learn from each other and we are when we're talking like, what are you going to do? Have you decided, right? Some colleagues have said, we're not going back until January. Um, other colleagues have said, we're not going to talk about whether, when we can go back until January because we think it's going to be June. Um, and so learning that, but also, you know, and I think this is a broader narrative around networking. And what I learned from my team is understanding that my team have their own networks of people. Um, that they can also ask. And so it is important to engage with them and ask them these questions because what I understand is that they're also asking that question of their own network because they can be bringing information um, to me that I might not have, um, but really important stuff for me to consider um, because it's the questions that they ask that I didn't think to ask um, and the people that they know that I don't know. Um, and I think all of us as leaders, certainly I am and some of my, my dear friends, we're all kind of trying to figure this out together in that way. Good. And a related question. Um, so, of course, many of us used to travel extensively on, on business. And I'm sure you did as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, business travel is almost by definition very energy intensive, both as a human being, but also with the transportation sources we, we all use to accomplish that mm -hmm. and very time intensive. Yeah. Any any thoughts as you as you wear your energy efficiency hat around what that means for for business travel for you and your staff going forward? Yeah. I mean, we, you know, I've done a little bit of business travel this year. I haven't done a lot because a lot of people aren't doing a lot in person. I'm going to do some um, in the back end of the year, but absolutely slow down. I think um, what it has caused us all to do is to really reflect on, do I really have to be there? Is this really something that I have to be there? Um, is, this, is this a meeting that has to be face-to-face -face or can we do it on a Zoom? And I think what we're learning, I think a year ago, I would have said, you know what, what I learned is that most things we don't have to be face to face. I will tell you a year later, I don't believe that to be true. I actually think that there are quite a few occasions where being face to face is absolutely the right thing to do. Um, but we need to be more strategic and probably a little bit more deliberate about how we build out an agenda um, and how much time you're going to spend, um, you know. I, I'm now starting to miss the travel. I didn't miss the travel in the beginning. I was like, I love being in my house. I don't ever need to see anybody ever again. Like this is the perfect situation. Um, and up until maybe July of this year, I felt that way. Like it was July, August where I was like, oh, you know, I kind of miss seeing people. Like it's kind of nice to just, you know, see somebody and have a cup of coffee or a drink and laugh about whatever 
the most random of things. Um, but that human interaction um, is helpful. And then I think, you know, just the other piece of it is, um, I think by nature, we do need to see each other in the way, and just to, to more effectively communicate with one another and the pro problem solve. There is something that is missing in development of relationship when you for. Um, and so the other thing about travel, I don't think that I will be as much as I be pre-pandemic and I traveled a lot. Um, so I don't expect it to go back to that, but I certainly don't expect that I'm never getting on another airplane. Like I'm getting on an airplane, I think in two weeks. So yeah, <laughs> you know, just gotta do it safe. But I'll probably always, just so you guys know, I'll probably always wear a mask on the airplane. COVID, no COVID, I'll be masked up on that airplane forever. For sure. It's been a life-changing experience, I think, it for has. all of us in a whole variety of different ways. Yeah. So, so one very important topic in the in the arena that we haven't touched on at all is cybersecurity. And of course, <laughs> cybersecurity just impacts, I mean, electricity and gas and water and telecom and, and broadband yeah. access. I mean, it just with that, with that convergence that's underway, uh, if one part of the system is impacted, why it has ripple effects throughout the entire, throughout yeah. the economy, actually. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts around cybersecurity and what that means in yeah. terms of your vision for energy efficiency? You know, and particularly with uh, technology making it even more digitized and, and, and the future opportunity being more digitized, um, Cyber is really important, as is privacy, those two things together. Um, and so part of it is like, how do we keep our system safe? But how are we going to be two steps ahead of the next hacker or the next person who's sending ransom? And I actually don't know how you do that. I think, you know, organization, I think you were with Epi for a period of time. Like, those are some of the things that I think you guys are also thinking about, like, how do we do that? Um, but adjacent to that is this idea of privacy. Um, and so customer privacy, I would think for our regulators becomes really important. Who, who has the data? Who owns the data? How can they use that data? What can that data be used for? Um, I would contend though, that for many of us, we don't really have a level of privacy that we think we have. Um, that's kind of, right? That, that cloudy thing, and, and the example I used for you, Barbara, is uh, last week, my husband and I um, brought my son to school in New Hampshire, and we were flying home, and as I was standing in line at TSA, there was a little sign that tells you that they no longer need your boarding passes at TSA. They just need your license, and when they scan your driver's license, they know what flight you're supposed to be on, and they know where you're going just from that, and I remember looking at the sign and saying, like, wait, what? Like, I didn't know that that was what that was. Um, and then I got to line. I said, gentlemen, do you need my boarding pass? He said, no. He scanned my license. Okay, have a good trip to so-and-so. And I was just kind of like, you know, so this idea of privacy, it's tricky. We give away so much of our information and we don't know it. Um, and yet we're, we're allowing lots of people to collect our inf information from those people who do genial, you know, ancestry.com and giving away all your medical history to 23andMe and these guys, because they are collecting your information when you submit your DNA. Anybody who doesn't know that, they are. Um, but those people who, you know, as we're thinking about technology in the future, our regulators really do have to contend with all these questions. Um, and then, and, and at the same time, figure out like, how do you do this in a way that doesn't give somebody a competitive advantage? particularly as it relates to energy efficiency and who's allowed to provide efficiency programs um, and who's managing that and who controls the money and, and how do we measure it and all of this stuff. So cyber, that's just, you know, it's really about how are we going to stay two steps ahead mm -hmm. and then manage risk. I would say a lot of cyber is also managing risk because there's so much risk, but um, so how do you manage that in a way that's effective and then what's your backstop so that we don't have, for example, another colonial pipeline 
right, where one portion has no, you know, gasoline prices are through the roof because there's no gasoline. And I'm, you know, we have aging infrastructure. I think that's why this point in Washington, this time in Washington is so really important. And the work that our members are doing is important. And if they get it right, um, because our infrastructure is already aging, I mean, it's already really easy for some hackers to kind of get into our systems. And so imagine if we all had smart meters um, or as my husband and I, I've been bugging my husband because I want I want an EV and I'd, I'd love to get a Tesla. And the only thing that like the thing that makes me think twice about it is like, but imagine that somebody hacked into Tesla and they were able to turn off your car or control your vehicle while you were like autopilot. So, you know, cyber, um, if we can imagine it, Somebody has already figured out how to do it, right? And so how do you take two steps ahead of that? So one of the important tools in the energy efficiency toolbox is demand response, which has similar exactly. characteristics associated with exactly. any, any thoughts around demand response? And I mean, I think demand response is a really important tool. And so it's not, I mean, even with the concerns around cyber, it is not to say that we shouldn't do it because I actually think we should do it. I think we should be aware, aware aware and figure out how we manage our risk. Um, but these are tools that we actually need. Um, demand response being a really great tool um, because without it, we're just gonna keep building more stuff. Like that's not a sustainable future. We've got to figure out another way um, to do what we need to do, um, to use, you know, and, our, and the amount of energy that we need is increasing because we have so much stuff we want it for. Um, and I don't know how you get there without demand response, um, but we still got to contend with all the other stuff that goes along with it. Absolutely. Well, this has been such a delightful hour with you, Paula. Oh, thank you. I, I can't thank you enough. It's just been wonderful to have a chance to hear about your vision for the Alliance to Save Energy and talk about these important topics and, and the very unusual times that we are all sharing together um, as we make this journey through a, a global pandemic. And I, thank you for joining WEC's Virtual Executive Exchange. I want to thank Robin Robinson on the WEC staff Thanks, who's Robin. helped makes this all happen. Robin, we could not do this without you. Thank you so much for all of the skills and talents you bring to WEC. Thank you to all of you in the audience for joining. We really appreciate your participation in our virtual exchange series. And we're delighted that you were able to be with us for this hour. And thank you to Paula Glover, President and CEO of the Alliance to Save Energy for this incredibly wonderful discussion and very informative time together. Paula, thank you especially for being with us and thank best you. wishes to you in your new role. Well, thank you. And Barbara, thank you for your leadership as well. Thank you for asking the tough questions. I appreciate it and the invitation. Thanks. And take care, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye. Bye.